This is the Word of God. So Heavenly Father, take this Word today and bring understanding to our, through our ears, give application to our feet and to our hands, to our mouths and to our whole being. We bless your holy name for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're doing so, we've, we do want to look further at this word altar. In the Hebrew, this word literally means slaughter. So every, everything that you have in your mind of an understanding of the kind of of, of the practice of worship of the people of God in the Old Testament, it, it makes sense that this word altar, this English word that we use, that in the Hebrew it literally means slaughter, bloodbath. It means a, a, a pouring out of that which gives life to the creature. In the Greek, the same word that is moved from the Greek to the English that we use, that we call, that we use the word altar. It means a place of sacrifice. So it essentially means the same. Well, the Hebrew meaning slaughtering, and the Greek meaning place of the slaughtering, the place of the sacrifice. So we see that there's, it's good for us to think through this, that there is indeed correlation to everything which should not surprise us the old testament is telling the narrative of the gospel always there will be a slaughter there will be a pouring of blood and there will be a place in which man meets with god that's what an altar is to the believers the the, the, the believers of the bible we, we will have a better understanding of this, and one can argue we should have a better understanding of this. But listen, even the pagan has an understanding of an altar, doesn't he? Because he's been imitating the practice of God's people, and he's been imitating the place. So there's locations for the pagan, for the idolater. He... He goes to a place, and what does he do when he gets there? He offers sacrifices. Now keep this in mind. All of the places that the pagans establish as places of worship or places for the sacrifices are unacceptable by God. Even God's people sometimes will set up altars in the wrong places. And then as well, not only will the place be an abomination to the Lord, but also too will be the act of worship. It will be an abomination to the Lord. They will offer their own children. They will offer unclean sacrifices. They will offer unacceptable sacrifices to God while they're giving them to their, their man-made pagan idols that they've created in their own minds. They're not worshiping an eternal God, are they, boys and girls? They're not worshiping a God who existed before the foundations of the earth. They're worshiping a God that they created on the spot, who can't do anything. What we should do is get, a, get some, some more understanding around this in the Scripture. Go with me to Judges. Now, do you recall what's going on in the book of Judges? There's the, the, the ebbing and the flowing. There's the roller coaster ride of a people who are with God and then, are, they, and then they disobey God and then they follow God and then they reject God and then they, they want, they, they cry out to God in repentance. And what does God do? But He hears them and He sends them a deliverer. The book of Judges is this repeated story, this repeated narrative of of hope that we would have in Jesus Christ. So you've, you've made your way there, haven't you? You're waiting on me to get there. Here it is, Judges, chapter 6. You'll be familiar with this. You know, you know the deliverer who God raises for the, the proper time, for such a time as they will be in need of deliverance You'll know him as Gideon. 
There are some things about Gideon that we, we must understand. He's living in a time when God's people have completely forgotten their God. What else is going on here? We learn in the first ten verses of, of, of Judges. See, I'm still not even there. I'm sitting in the book of Joshua. And I'm looking here thinking, this, this doesn't seem to look like the right page. And it wasn't. Here, this looks very familiar now. Judges chapter 6, let me read the first 10 verses. Then the sons of Israel, notice this, they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hands of Midian seven years. The power of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of Midian, the sons of Israel made for themselves the dens which were in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. It was when Israel was had it, it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites would come up with the Amalekites and the sons on, of the east and go against them. Verse four. So they would camp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance of, in Israel, as well as no sheep, ox, or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and with their tents. They would come in like locusts for number. Both they and their camels were innumerable, and they came into the land to devastate it. Verse 6. So Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the sons of Israel, what did they do? They cried to the Lord. Now it came about when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord on the account of Midian that the Lord sent a prophet to the sons of Israel. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, it was I who brought you up from the land of Egypt and brought you out from the house of slavery. I delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hands of your oppressor and dispossessed them before you and gave you their land. Verse 10, And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you live, but you have not obeyed me. So we get the setup in verse in these first ten verses of Judges, chapter six, that the Israelites had forgotten God. They had forgotten that Yahweh had delivered their ancestors out of the house of slavery and gave them a new place, a place that's described. On all accounts, is a place flowing with milk and honey. It's a description of, of fertile soil, of abundance of crops. And what had, been, what had become the condition of the people of God? Because they had forgotten God, God raised up an enemy who hated God and hated His people. And what do they do? But they come and devastate them. Israelites will go out and with a rake plant some seed and in a couple of days something would sprout up and what would happen but the the Midianites would come in and totally devastate it they would let their their beast walk in their fields they would pull down their vineyards they would destroy everything and so thus the condition of the people you can you can only imagine they can't grow their own crops they're having trouble with their enemies. And so you can, you can just begin to imagine some of the problems. They're having a hard time in the economy. They're having a hard time feeding their homes. They can't hardly afford to go to the market. And yet at the same time, every time they get something to sprout in the soil, the enemy comes along and devastates it. So the people did the right thing. They cried out, to Yahweh. They cried out to God to come and deliver them from the hand of the Midianites. Well, verse 11 continues 
with more of this. We learn more about the condition of the Israelites at this time. The angel of the Lord, verse 11, came and sat under the oak that was in Orpha, which belonged to Joash, uh, as his, uh, the Aberazite, as his son Gideon, was beating out wheat in the winepress in order to save it from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. And Gideon said to him, My Lord, if, if Yahweh is with us, then why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord looked at him and said, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? He said to him, O Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest of my father's house. Verse 16, But the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat Midian as one man. So Gideon said to the Lord, If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. Please do not depart from here until I come back to you and bring out my offering and lay it before you. And he said, I will remain until you return. So I hope, I hope you're tracking this. There's the language that Gideon is familiar with the actions of worship at the altar of the Lord. He says, I, 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 want, I want to worship the Lord here, but I've not come prepared to do this. Verse 19, Then Gideon went in and prepared a young goat and an unleavened bread from the ephah of flour. And he put the meat in a basket and broth in a pot and brought them out to him under the oak and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay it on, the ro- on this rock. And pour out the broth. And so he went. This, this will help us connect a little bit of what we've been learning over the last couple of weeks. These altars are, are made of rock or metal overlaid the wood so that whenever the fire is lit, it does not burn the altar. So this is, this is a, a rock. It is a, an altar. It, it meets that expectation that we would have with, with what we would Expect to be happening here. Verse 20, the angel of the Lord said to him, Take the meat, the unleavened bread, and lay it on this rock, and pour out the broth. And so he did. Verse 21, the angel of the Lord put out the end of his staff that was in his hand, and he touched the meat and the unleavened bread and the fire. And fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. And the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. When, God, when, when Gideon saw this, saw that he was in the, he was, saw this, he was in the, he was, he saw this, that he was the angel of the Lord. He said, alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said to him, peace to you. Do not fear, you shall not die. And Gideon, he built an altar there to the Lord and named it, The Lord is Peace. To this day, at the time of the writing, it is still in Ophrah of the Abyssalites. Verse 25, Now on the same night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and the second bull seven years old and pull down, notice this, the altar's, the altar of Baal. That tells us the pagans have been imitating the Israelites in their practice of worship. And God, God is telling Gideon, take your father's bull, 
and take a second bull with you and tear down this altar, which belongs to your father. Oh my goodness. Gideon's father has been practicing pagan idolatry. And Gideon is being told, go and tear down your father's altar. Cut down the Asherah that is beside it. And there, build an altar to the Lord your God. And on top of this stronghold, in an orderly manner, and take a second bull and offer a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah, which you shall cut down. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had commanded him or spoken to him. And because he was too afraid of his father's household, meaning his brothers, even his own father, and the men of the city, he did it by night. We'll, we'll stop the reading there for just a moment and get up to speed on a, on a handful of things. You're, you're tracking this, aren't you? There, the central piece here is that there are altars involved. There's a place where God requires, there is a practice that God requires of His people for proper worship. And there is a place and there is a practice of a people who belong to God who have given themselves to the worship of mute, deaf gods who can do nothing. A couple of things that I think are, are noteworthy of noticing here. Notice that it is God who's giving the instructions. Gideon wasn't sitting over at the wine press one day threshing the wheat. And he was, he was threshing the wheat in the wine press because... He, didn't, he, he thought that was the safest place that the enemies, the Midianites, wouldn't, would, they, they would know he's not there pressing grapes because they've already devastated their vineyards. So they just give him a pass that he's at the wine press. Uh, and what is he doing? But he's, he's threshing the wheat so he can take it back home and bake some bread. And while he's there, an angel of the Lord appears to him and gives him instructions and says, you. I have heard the plight of, of, of God's people. And so he calls him, he calls Gideon in verse 12, a valiant warrior. Now, it's so easy for us to, to throw rocks at Gideon because we, we have the whole of the story. And he, does, he indeed does some valiant things, but, but we also must realize it's really kind of God to call a weak man a valiant warrior. So Gideon's afraid. Gideon will do what God commands him to do. Gideon will even lead an army by, by all respects of man's strength, a pitiful lot of men. And he will destroy the Midianites by the power of God. He'll do so by obeying the command of God. And this will be the practice. This will be the work that Gideon can be called a valiant man because look, look he does obey God. Imperfectly. See, it kind of sounds like you and me sometimes, doesn't it? We know what God wants from us. Yes, yeah, sometimes we're struck by fear of men. We don't want to be seen as the, the one who only obeys God, and we don't give any room for someone else to be followers of God who really are not followers of God at all. We more fear man than we do God, don't we? So yet, in, in Gideon's imperfect, imperfect obedience, he does do what God commands him to do. He goes and he destroys the altar of, of the Baal. And so much so, the, the angel of the Lord tells him, hey, by the way, that Asherah pole, that, raw, that, that, that stick, that tree that's been stripped of all of its limbs, I want you to take that and use it as the wood of the fire that you're going to place on the altar that you're going to build for me. Um, so in other words, we're not leaving anything for your, for your father's household to come back in and rebuild their altar. Now they will, they will get wind. The, the next morning they'll wake up and they'll, they'll see the devastation of this and they'll be struck by 
disgust of what Gideon has done. But yet at the end of the moment, we can rejoice that Gideon did what he was instructed to do. I want to even make an argument that this could well have been a more difficult task for Gideon than to actually get an army small enough to go do what God commanded him to do. Because here he's having to even deal with his own household. It's easier to go against a known enemy, isn't it? It really is. But, but to go against your father's house, to go against what they would want or what they have established, this is, not, this is no easy thing. But notice this. Well, God will draw you to worship Him. And when God draws us to worship Him, it's important that we pay close attention to how He instructs us to worship Him. This altar is not Gideon's idea. What's offered on the altar is not Gideon's idea. It's from God's people that God gave to Moses as they're leaving their place of slavery. So he's following the historic, the ancient instructions of his people in the worshiping of God. When God gives him the instructions to bring along the second bull, and it's that second bull that he will offer on the altar that he builds and uses the wood from his father's Asherah to light the fire. Excuse me, he doesn't light the fire, does he? It's the angel of the Lord that touches the altar with his staff, and it, it ignites. It's not the only time in Scripture, is it, where God lights his own altar. But it is a kindness of God that he would instruct him, that he would provide for him. I think we also should see here that God does not allow substitute altars. So track this with me. He, he does, he, he's the one who draws you to worship Him. And He has no room. He is a jealous God, the Bible tells us. He gives no room for substitute altars. He tells you to build an altar of stone and you build an altar out of Legos. No, he, there's no room for substitutes here. He tells you to build an altar and He tells you to put the, the slaughtered bull on the altar. And no substitute will do here. No amount of frogs will suffice for the requirement of a bull. God required what God required and it would be important for Gideon here to follow the specific instructions concerning the worship of God at the place where God told him to build the altar. And then I think we also need to see, with Gideon it certainly helps us, Abram shows us this. What we'll see with Abram will be more historic narrative. Uh, there's something leading Abram to obey God. It seems as though it, it comes from the house really all the way back to Seth, that third, that third son of Adam and Eve, where we read that for the first time that the worship of God is renowned throughout, throughout all the populated places of the world at this time. Then from, Seth, from Seth's household to Noah, that there is an uninterrupted worship of God by the use of, of building altars. And then from Noah through Shem... And from Shem to Abram, there is an, an uninterrupted path of the people of God offering proper and sufficient sacrifices to God. That's more narrative. We don't have the specific details of this until Moses is leading the people of Israel out of slavery, the house of slavery in Egypt, where, they get the, where we get the specific instructions of what kind of altars they are to build and what they're to offer on these altars. It doesn't mean they didn't have these instructions prior to this, but it hadn't been codified in law until Moses is given this word from God to give to the people. And he establishes 
a proper way in which the people will know that this is how you worship God. So God determines what happens at this altar. So God draws a people to an altar. He does not allow substitute altars. And God determines what happens at this altar. He decides what's done at this place. He decided who has permission to offer the sacrifice. He regulates who leads the people. And He orders this. We we'll see in the narrative of, of the book of Genesis that there are times where families will be instructed by God to worship. We'll ultimately see that there is there is equally important that there would be a corporate people who will be instructed in how to worship God. These are profound things. We've noted this along the way. We'll see this with Abram. It was not long before... I'll be more able to consistently say Abraham. Uh, we'll see this with Isaac. We'll see this with Jacob. We'll see this with Moses. We move beyond the book of Genesis before we can get to Moses or Aaron or Gideon as we have today in the book of Judges. But we'll also see this with David, with Solomon. We'll see this in the northern kingdom whenever there is a divide of the, of the house of God. And we'll see that the northern kingdom, they forget the instructions of God and in convenience, out of convenience, the northern kingdom provides more convenient places for sacrifices to be brought by God's people and offered to God and they will all be wrong. It'll be wrong that they do that because it is not in the instructions in which God has given to His people. So during these times of rebellion, like what we read about in Judges chapter 6, this is one of about a dozen of times just in the book of Judges where we read that they rebel against God, and that His people have forgotten. They, they, they're not even regularly worshiping God. We'll see, as we get back into the, into the Genesis narrative, we'll see that the Philistines, they will, be, they will be perpetually following God's people through their journeys what will they be doing? They'll be tearing down the altars. They'll be throwing garbage into the wells. The Philistines will be perpetually wanting to destroy what God's people have been doing along the way to give glory to God and to remind their ancestors as they travel through these regions, here, God met Abram. Here, God met Isaac. Here, God met Jacob. But the enemy of God... He'll be perpetually trying to destroy those places. If he can't do it outright, he'll do it subtly. Gideon would be directed, as we've read here, to tear down the pagan altar. Elijah, I haven't even mentioned that famous altar, that famous showdown of a pagan substitute altar. What would Elijah do? He would build an altar and God would consume it with fire from heaven, putting the Baal priest to shame. This is really important that we not forget these actions of God's people. Throughout all of world history, there have been seasons of restoration that we should expect to fall upon certain generations whenever God's people, much like what we read about in the book of Judges, they forget God and find the appeasement or they find the worship of the pagans so much easier. It'll look so much more appealing to them. It'll look more attractive to those who don't know God. And so what will they do? They will begin to adopt the practices of the people in which God has put them to stand out as different than them. So throughout world history, and specifically we can say church history, and we would include the nation of Israel when we use the term church history here, that there is a perpetual, there are perpetual means in which God's people will be required by God to return to the Word of God and follow the precepts of Scripture. 
Historically, we know that the church has had to reform. They've had to revisit. They've had to tear down. They've had to, they've had to build. They've, to use the language of Isaiah, they've had to straighten crooked paths. They've had to lower highways. They've had to elevate roads. They've been required to, ref, to be reforming throughout the ages of, of human history. By the time of the Great Reformation, there was a laundry list of corrections that the church had totally f- forgotten God in. Some of those corrections were done more rapidly than others. They were easier to tear down. The timid could tear them down. But there would be some that they wouldn't go far enough in in the reforming of proper worship to God. So what we want to do in, 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 in taking into consideration this altar, this, the, the practice of an altar, the central place that it, the, the, the central figure that it is in the worship of God's people, we must be reminded here that there, there are individuals who are involved in this worship. These, wor- these individuals are invited to gather with other individuals to worship. That's what we do. It's important. You know, there's been seasons in this modern era of church where people want to apply worship as more individualistic than corporate. Well, let's be sure. It's, it's proper that you worship God in your homes. It really is important that you do that. There will be a practice. But what, would be, what, what needs to be reformed is that we would also recognize that there is a corporate action. Actions that we do together. We gather at the same place. We gather at the same time. We gather in the same room. We gather to sing the same songs. We gather to read the same Scripture. We gather to say in agreement with each other the things that we know are true. We come to a common table together, all of us. The professing believers, we come to, the, we come to communion with God because this is what God's people do whenever it's provided for the people. So in, individuals definitely sin and individuals must repent when they sin. Corporate bodies, churches sin. Churches, when they sin, they too must repent. And then there are, (coughs) excuse me, there's the relationship to the nation that we cannot forget either. Nations do sin against God, don't they? The people of God should call upon that same government to repent of her sins. It's not easy. We're somewhat timid to do so. We don't want to be called... We don't want to be called names. We don't want to be made fun of. We don't want to be the butt of everyone's joke. So we somewhat timidly go about our business when really what needs to happen is there needs to be a bold standing of God's people. What kind of sins ought to be brought before this altar of God? I hope you understand that there's a difference between root sins and fruit sins. Fruit sins are sins that they're, they're initiated from the root. Like a, you, you plant a tree in your backyard and you want, you want someday for it to produce luscious, sweet-tasting peaches. Um, there will be sins, if you will, that that tree will produce. But we don't cut the tree down because a bird comes along and picks away at the fruit. There, 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 are, there are ways that we can preserve and protect and and establish the tree to be more fruitful. But whenever there's a sickness in the tree, we have to deal with it different than a bird or a bug or an earwig that 
seems to devastate and, and destroy the crop. So we, we deal with the root sins. The book of Jude helps us understand some of this difference. We can essentially summarize it down that there are, there are essentially three types of root sins that every sin we are committing are a result or come from the fruit or come from the root of stubbornness, rebellion, and disbelief. Those three root sins are the sins that we must give the most of our attention to that we need to be repenting of. Stubbornness. Rebellion and disbelief. You stop and think about what we read about in the Old Testament and we'll see this pattern is very true. When we, when we read about sins that the individuals are committing, we'll read about David's sins. They're in front of the whole world to, to see every time we read the Psalms. But you know the, pro, the greatest problem in David's life is not his adultery. It'll be his stubbornness, his rebellion, and his disbelief. That, that adultery will come from the root that he hasn't dealt with. This will be true in your own life as well. There's sins that you're always dealing with while you avoid the real root problem. So here's, here's what altars are for. Altars are for dealing with serious sins. For root sins. It's for, for dealing with sins that, that cause other sins. What happens at these altars? There is a meeting place. There is a meeting between righteousness and unrighteous. There's a meeting of the righteous God with the unrighteous people. And it is a required meeting. You can understand why man wants to create another kind of worship because he cannot stand righteousness. He needs a place that he can worship God that he never has to come to deal with of the root problems of his own life. And so what will he do? He'll choose churches that won't preach against sins. He'll, he'll, put, he'll, he'll even find himself and surround himself with others who laugh and dance and ignore the real problems of their own lives. They'll never look at the root sins. They'll laugh at the fruit sins because how silly they are. And you know what it's like when you want to avoid something serious. You're more able to do it when you're laughing, when you're joking, when there's no light to expose the sin at the, at the center of the, uh, of the problem. So we have these root sins of stubbornness, rebellion, and disbelief. These are root sins. What, are, what, what is the opposite of, of, of these kinds of sins? The opposite of stubbornness is compliant. Now these, will be, these can almost be uh, similar kind of words as we journey through this, but think of the stubbornness in which we pick up and we refuse to obey God in. But God has called us to be not compliant with our own wills, with our own motives, but to be compliant with His directions. He's given an order. It's right for us to be compliant. The opposite of that would be, I'm not going to do it that way. Every one of us have behaved like this to our parents at one time or another. But to be compliant, to, to have an understanding that the order in which God has directed me is better for me. Stubbornness we create inside of us. I, I know that my way is better for me. And it will, be, it will be easier for me rather than to be compliant with the instructions that God has given to us. The opposite of rebellion is loyal. God has given a word. An unchanging God has given a word to His people. It would be 
it would be the right attribute for God's people to be loyal. In spite of how the peoples around us are behaving, that we would be loyal to God. We would follow His directions. And then, of course, here's how similar these are. Is we, the opposite of disbelief is belief. God said to do this, and so we do. We consider what is said in these root sins of stubbornness, rebellion, and disbelief, and we consider what is said about those who have come properly to the altar in which God has placed before them. And, and notice how different they are than those who come on their own terms or create their own methods and their own sacrifices, create their own altars rather than to be obedient to God. Well, we need one more piece of Scripture to put the final application here for us. And that will be in Isaiah chapter 5. This will, this will move rather fast here. And, and it's my hope that you've already been, by the, by the work of the Holy Spirit, there's already been application being applied to you. But now let's be, let's, let's be real overt with, with the application. In Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, you'll be familiar with this. This is a song. Isaiah, the singing prophet, he, 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 by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he lays out a, a parable in the form of a song. So verse 1, let me sing now of my well-beloved, the song of my beloved. This is Isaiah chapter 5, if I hadn't said that prior to now. A song of my, of my beloved concerning his, God's vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it all around and removed its stones and planted in it the choicest vine, and he built a tower in the middle of it and also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there for me to do for my vineyard than what I have already done in it? Why then, I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now let my people, or now let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it will become consumed. Think of Gideon, if you will. Gideon's time, Gideon's day. I will break down its wall and it will become trampled ground. I will lay it waste. It will not be pruned or hoed, for briars and thorns will come up. And I will also change, I will also charge the clouds to rain no rain on it. Verse 7 For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his delightful plant. Thus he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, a cry of distress. You see this? This is in a nutshell, in, in the form of a song, what Gideon was facing, and really what all people of God face when they, when, when they, when they do not remain compliant to the Lord's commands or loyal to the Lord as their God or obedient to His instructions. This will be the normal expectation. Perhaps you've even found this true in your own life in certain seasons of your life. Well, clearly, stubbornness has been the, was, the, was the ruling force in your life. Or rebellion was the normal air you breathed or disbelief. It's not possible that God only has one way for man to worship Him. And so thus, a season of utter devastation. The verses that follow this in Isaiah chapter 5 are those classic statements of woe. I, don't want, to, I, want, to, I want to consider the opposite of the woe for the application. 
There's certainly the warning that is there, and you should, you should heed the warning that is there. For example, in verse 8, Woe to those who wrongly judge. Love using, uh, they, they love using unjust weights and measures. But those who come to the altar of God are not like that. Those of you who come to worship the one true living God, you're compliant to His instructions, you're obedient to His Word, and in in that, you're also behaving as a loyal worshiper of the living God. And so, rather rather than wrongly judging and using unjust weights and measures in life, the people of God at the altar of God, they return to the workplace as honest, careful individuals. They return to their homes as people of integrity. But not those who worship their own gods. They love their unjust weights and measures. In verse 11, we'll read this woe to those who pursue selfish ambitions, if you were to summarize it into one one, one expression. But you know, those who are loyal to God, those who are compliant to His Word, those who are loyal to His instructions, when they come to the altar of God, there are people who are paying attention to the deeds of the Lord. They see God at work. They're the people of God. They have knowledge. They're honorable individuals. They endure as honorable men. They hunger and they thirst for righteousness. They're not motivated by selfish ambitions. God is the one who's instructing them and they're motivated by God. In verse 18, we hear the warning of those who have fallen prey to the worship of their own gods in their own ways at their own altars. God says to them, Woe to those who tie ropes to falsehoods and drag them through the streets as though they're in, they're in parade. And they point everyone's attention to the falsehoods that they're dragging through the public square, but not the people of God. The people of God, they recognize the lies that are on parade. And they will not participate. They don't go along with it. The warning is to those who do go along with it. The joy is to those who do not participate. In verse 20, we see the warning of those who call evil good and good evil. But blessed be the people of God. When they come to the altar of God, they walk from the altar with knowledge of what is good. And they know what is evil and that they should practice what is good and restrain themselves from evil. In verse 21, the warning is to those who are wise in their own eyes. They're stubborn. They're rebellious. They're disobedient. They're wise in their own eyes. They're clever in their own sight. The opposite of that would be those who come to the altar of God. They remained obedient and loyal and compliant to Him. And they're wise in the ways of God. In their humility, they obey God. They're thought thought by the world as the fool. But rather, they are the ones who are being faithful and enduring to the end. Verse 22, we see the warning of those who are heroes of debauchery, drunkenness, wasting away, bragging of their own lamp of darkness. They light their lamps and then they shade the light that it would otherwise give. So thus they they are no good to anybody. But those who come to the altar of God, they've come by God's appeal. They've come by the invitation of God. Notice who's initiating the invitation. It's God who's, who initiated the invitation to Gideon. It's God who initiated the invitation to Abram. It's God who's initiating 
the invitation, come and worship. Those who come to the altar of God, they stand in the gap of others rather than the heroes of debauchery. They're the champions of justice rather than frequenters of drunkenness. Those who come to the altar of God, they cherish the Word of God. They don't waste their day away on the, on the foolish philosophies of men. They do not hide, those who come to the, to the altar of God, they do not hide the lamp of Scripture in the marketplace, but rather the lamp of Scripture leads them through the marketplace to do what is just and fair and right. You see, you see the differences? The difference is the altar. And the difference is what happens at the altar. It's the hymn writer of old who says, have you been to Jesus? I mean, here's, here's some more of that consideration when Jesus says, what, what's more important, the sacrifice that's on the altar or the altar? Here, here's, here's, the, here's where we are different than all others in the world. We've come to Jesus because He's offered us a satisfying sacrifice. Not, not one that we should weigh and say, well, which one do I really want to participate in? One is true and the other is an all-out lie. Have you been to Jesus, the hymn writer says, for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Have you been to the slaughter? Have you been to the place where the blood of Christ... And we're not talking physically... We're talking spiritually here. Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily in the Savior's side? He continues on. Do you rest each moment in the crucified? When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. What about it, friend? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? If not, you've been to the wrong altar. If not, you're living in rebellion, stubbornness, and disobedience. You see, when we read about these altars in the book of Genesis, I, I want us to think of the slaughter, the requirement for our sins. Now, yes, there will be much rejoicing at these altars as well. And there should be. The sin that's been forgiven, to the one who's been forgiven, he should lift his head because his Savior is nigh. His Savior has redeemed him. He's been washed in the blood of the Lamb. There are times in your life where you've walked through significant hardships. The Lord has journeyed you through unbelievable, unforeseen hardships, oh, the right thing would be that there would be a place, a memorial place where you remember what God did. Not what you did, but what God did. Have you been to this altar? If it's been a while, then it's time to return, isn't it? It's time to participate with the reformers of old. It's time for you to bring your ox and tear down the altars of the dead gods and approach the altar of the living God. May God restore His people today. And may we, when we think about this altar moving forward in the Scriptures, may we perpetually be reminded of the slaughter and the sacrifice.